Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics, and we are here again with this comic book community market trends. That's right. This is the three up, three down. We're giving you three up trends and three down trends of what's going on in the comp community. Jack, how's your week so far? Oh, week's been great, man. We just got done with an awesome live interview with Frank Gogol from Source Point Press with his uh, much anticipated second volume to that big hit indie smash success, Dead End Kids. So I'm still kind of living off the high of that interview and now getting to talk about hot properties, hot comics, the moving and shaking in the secondary market. There's a lot to talk about, but you know what, Brian, there were some great picks we left off the list this week. So definitely everybody out there in the Superman's Comics family, make sure you let us know in the comments section, what do you see as moving up? What do you see moving down? What do you see moving and shaking in the comics market today? And you never know, you just may see your pick wind up in one of our future videos. Yeah, really enjoyed the Frank Google interview. If you guys haven't checked that out, make sure you check it out. Also, check the link to check the description of that video because we got links to that Dead End Kids Volume 1 trade paperback you can get as well as that Frank Google newsletter that is pretty hot. He gives you early release news on a lot of those variants that are coming up that definitely go up on the secondary market because it's so limited in, in copies. But with that being said, we're getting right into the three-up portion this week. The first one we're talking about is Conan the Barbarian. Conan's been on a run, hasn't he, Brian? I mean, this is this has been going for a while. We've seen Conan's move to Marvel um, affect the comic market. We've seen Conan's implementation into the Marvel universe with like the No Surrender storyline, really uh, having an impact on readers and collectors. We, Secret Avengers has been great. Savage Avengers, yeah, that, that was the yeah, next thing. Savage, it's, my bad. Yeah, his his his, uh, his entry into the Savage Avengers. Um, then kind of giving him his own kind of aesthetic within a Marvel Universe book. All of these properties, I mean, it's been home run after home run after home run. So the announcement that now we're going to have some other form of media, albeit not seemingly directly a Marvel thing, um, but a Netflix television series that is going to be live action, that is going to be big budget, that apparently is going to be huge in scope, his entire uh, Conan the Barbarian universe um, yeah, I think that this is exactly uh, what the market is looking for. So we're seeing those those first appearances shoot up. Conan number one is on fire. Um, and what I also like that we're seeing is we're seeing renewed interest in the brand new Marvel stuff, which I've said for a long time. You and I have talked about this long-term play, Conan number one, the Marvel book, uh, I think is going to be a long-term book to pay attention to. Uh, it, I think that Conan is a character that, uh, certainly has the potential, has been a generational character that has connected with audiences. There have been some misses along the way, uh, but I have faith that they're going to get this right. And uh, I think the, I think kind of like a certain community, um, I don't want to define that community with a label, but that like these kind of like fantasy, all-engulfing stories, um, think uh, Game of Thrones people, um, they are looking for that next show, right? You know, Walking Dead kind of fell a bit. Game of Thrones is gone. Um, you know, everybody, they, I feel like those people are looking for another show. And they, I think this could be that. Yeah, and you know they need behind this show is they need those showrunners or the people that were involved in Spartacus on Stars. That was one of the best series and that would translate so well to the whole Conan universe. Mm -hmm. But I only have one big two book on my pool list and it's actually the current Conan the Barbarian storyline. I've had that on since issue one. Everything else is indie books because Third Eye Comics, the smaller store where I'm at, they don't get too many of the indie books that I like. So it's mostly indie books and then Conan the Barbarian. But you the next one we're going to move... Flash? I don't have the Flash. I just order it when I need to. Actually, oh. Flash I've been picking up on trades. Flash. Josh Williamson sadly ending his run. But that's right. That's what I was getting. I figured when Joshua Williamson stepped away, so did you. Yeah. But the next one we're talking about in the three up, this is a book we've talked about in here before. And a lot of our Patreon members we've talked about throughout the summer, but Lumberjanes, we just got a new announcement about this series, right? One, it's ending in December. Yeah. Ending in December. Um, and then also we've known for a long time that this has been optioned, right? This has been a, a option play for a while. Yeah, first by Fox and then right Fox, then Disney, and then now through, uh, HBO max. And that we, we also know that the script has gone through a few iterations. So like, this is well on the way this is coming and HBO max is certainly a great platform. 
Uh, a lot of people have HBO. A lot of people are very comfortable watching shows. We've certainly seen uh, HBO shows penetrate the secondary market with, uh, you know, a lot of their properties being I insane uh, kind of like cult successes. So I think you're only going to see that. Yeah, you know, going forward here. Also, this could give them a flagship animated franchise. And if you're not familiar with Lumberjanes, great story, really a great uh, kind of coming of ages tale. One that's always felt like it was made for something cinematic, but it's always kind of lended itself as, man, this would be a really great animated feature. And it's, you know, I'm glad to see that it's going that way. Now, here's the funny thing, Brent. I really was looking at putting this one on the downside of the list earlier in the week. Because when we started to hear talks about a new revision of a script, I started to look at secondary market prices and was stunned to see this book trading for about $25 right now. Now, this has been a $50 to $75 first print for quite some time raw. Um, so $25 just sounds cheap. But you know what's happened in the last 24 hours since we've seen this HBO Max announcement? We're seeing prices jump with each copy hitting buy it now sales 30 to 35 to 40 to 45 and continuing to grow so this is one to be on the lookout for this is one to pay attention to and this is one to go hunt for because there may be stores still pricing based on that 25 dollar uh price tag those days are gone this is back on its way to being 50 dollars and up and to me i see triple digits in this book's future yeah, not to mention, Boom also, when this series launched, had that limited to 250 copy, that black and white. Oh, yeah, Super Ghost. Yeah, web exclusive variant. But next one we're talking about on the three up. We've talked about this artist lots of times on this channel. Some good, some bad. I've said both. But we're talking about Peach Momoko. Some people might not have heard of her. Yeah, you know. People, they just haven't been reading comics. Right, right. Yeah. Somebody told me it's the year of the peach or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but either way, uh, obviously, you know, Peach Momoko has been the number one name in the game for the last year. So it's funny when Brian and I were crafting this list, we said, you know, we, I could kind of play this a couple different ways. Like Peach Momoko is obviously red hot because Peach Momoko got a brand new deal. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But let me tell you what's on the downside. A lot of retailers out there, Brian, a lot of retailer exclusive producers, they're going to be crying some tears. Not only that, a lot of publishers there. I'm thinking Dynamite Comics. I'm thinking Titan Comics. I'm thinking IDW Comics. Uh, Boom Studios, uh, while they've got a cover deal for about 20 covers with her in there, uh, I only think of like two covers into that. Um, it, that's now got an expiration date because Peace from Oko has signed an exclusive deal with Marvel Comics. Um, this is a big deal because... Peace Momoko has made the Ascension, in my opinion, the right way. She's come up from small press. She's done retailer exclusive variants. She proved herself a commodity in the market. Yeah, she did some Marvel stuff. Um, and, but she really earned her popularity. And so now Marvel tabbing her as uh, one of the top artists that they're looking to work with, one of the elite artists. Uh, I think it's only going to continue to raise her profile. So yeah, there's going to be some disappointed people out there. Uh, I know she moved a lot of copies for a lot of smaller publishers. And I know a lot of variant producers who have gotten uh, very wealthy off of Peach Momoko variants. Uh, but hey, the game still is there. You're just going to have to play it a little differently and move in to, to Marvel stuff with her. Um, but I think it's exciting too, because you're going to get to see her work on a array of products. And not just that for my fans out there who are maybe tired of, maybe exhausted with some of the Peach Momoko retailer exclusives, chasing all of those. Uh, you're going to see a lot of cover price Marvel Peach Momoko work now. Um, so there's going to be some accessibility. I know the collectors may hate that because it may uh, overexpose her a bit. She's but, about to be art germed. <laughs> yeah, because she, she is. But at the same point, um, if you've been complaining for the last year about not being able to get a Frankie's Comics drop or something like that, now this is going to be your opportunity to pick up something. You, I know that's not what you want to hear because I know that the comic uh, uh, customer tends to be inherently a I want my cake and eat it too kind of customer where you want it to be scarce, but you also want it. So that it gets to be tough and it going with the push and pull there. But like uh, I've been watching a lot of Cobra Kai, so you got to find the balance. But that's going to be almost the perfect transition because we're talking about Peach Momoko. Another one that's on the down right now, our first downward trend, is that Marvel Young Guns brand. A bunch of great artists on there, but what's going on with these? Well, you remember when the Young Guns first was a thing and how big of a deal it felt like to us as like young comic collectors and readers? It felt like th this was the rookie class. NXT. 
Yeah. It, to, to kind of to kind of compare it to different things that maybe some of our audiences will appreciate. It felt like that rookie draft class in sports. It feels like if you're a pro wrestling fan, it felt a lot like uh, NXT. It felt like uh, your indie, your evolved wrestlers getting signed to NXT. Um, your, so your favorite indie guys are now making it big. If you're a hip hop fan, it felt like the double XL freshman class. Um, so it, it felt like a you know marvel tabbing this new group and you look back at some of the original um young guns and some are big stars and some aren't so you know you've got some you've got some kobe's and you've got some kwame browns and you've got a little bit of everything in between um but it's almost one of those things where i forgot the young guns program was a thing now last year we got a young guns variance but if the program felt a little weird because it was like with zafino and uh, yeah, some people couple, that people knew yeah like they didn't feel like i mean i'm not commenting on their ages but it didn't feel like you were giving me like that next crop of people yeah. it felt like you were giving me people that i was already paying attention to and buying yeah but it's like me being a giants fan with mike yastrzemski when orioles fans are like we had him too bad right. we didn't keep his ass <laughs> right yeah ain't no doubt about that um but but you know that's the thing is is i feel like the young guns program has has lost a bit of its luster um, it's not as, as, as relevant. And I think where this really comes into play is a lot of people are talking about this Peach and Mocha exclusive deal with, with Marvel. We just talked about it. But it wasn't until we investigated that deal that we even found out that the, the crux of the reason for the exclusive deal is Marvel actually signed like eight artists to exclusive deals. And they're all artists who didn't previously have exclusive deals because they're part of the brand new Young Guns team so Pichamoko is a young guns artist now they're calling this team now the Stormbreakers. they're kind of changing the name um what that's just a branding thing it's still the young guns you know it's it's still the young guns and they're riding that thor hotness right exactly yeah they're trying to catch that uh donny kate's wave of success but um you know and the in the lineup of of artists and people that they're working with is still it's it's still impressive there's still some names uh that i can appreciate they did a better job, I feel like, being on brand with it being kind of the next up there. Although I look at you and go Peach Pomoko. But, you know, either way, I, I think that this, this is still a program that I think could be very successful, that could get people excited, that could I, – I could see it being something that people collect. Like, I collect Young Guns books. But, but if it's not something that you really market and if it's not something that, that you really, really associate, I, I think for it to work – any artist who's a young gun, as soon as someone talks about that artist, they have to associate that program with it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And I think it's lost that luster. So I would love to see it come back into prominence. Let us know in the comments section. Have you ever been a young guns fan? Uh, what do you think they need to get yeah. kind of back on people's radar? Javier, that Javier Garon kind of built his name up within that program as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think you can, right? That's the point of it, right? There's you Because you're going to get a lot of exposure and a lot of work. I'd, I'd be on the lookout for R.B. Silva was the name that immediately stood out to me on the new Young Guns list. I said, you know, R.B. Silva is an artist who, who has a lot of potential. Next one we want to talk about for the three down. We heard he's coming back in the movies, but we're talking about Electro. Yeah, so I, you could argue this is not down, right? Because there's definitely been sales of the first he was, appearance. He wasn't good in Spider Amazing Spider-Man. So this is the point that I'm making, right? When we have announcements like this, usually you start to see, uh, and it's one of the things Brian and I market on, um, how many people are going to buy uh, ASM 9 first appearance of Electro? Not many, because it's just out of the average person's price range. You look at $800 plus. Um, that's not the book for everybody. So when Electro was popular the last time before the last movie, and I say before, because as soon as you saw the movie, he wasn't popular anymore. The toys sat every toy aisle for a year, had a, a, a Jamie Foxx Electro toys everywhere. Um, but when the movie was coming out, you started to see all those Electro cover appearances, similar to the way on the top 10, we predicted to pay attention to Galactus and Dr. Doom cover appearances because they kind of got that Thanos vibe. Um, Electro had some of that going. So you started to see those Todd McFarlane Spider-Man issues. Um, Todd McFarlane had a, a entire arc of Electro versus Spider-Man, and those shot up to like $10 an issue, which is ridiculous for dollar books that are printed in the millions. But it, you also had where Marvel current publishing had changed Electro to look more like Jamie Foxx. 
uh, to be more direct, they changed his race. And that started to get popular. So those issues started to sell well. Here, we're not getting any of that. People are skeptical. You know why I think that is, Brian? Molten man, sand man, <laughs> hydro man. People lost their butts. You can even put, put Rhino in there with Electro last time when Rhino was in there like five minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah, Paul Giamatti. Yeah, yep. that, that's, but that's another example. Like Spider-Man villains have cost people a lot of money. Now, Mysterio was awesome. But we, the nature of, of kind of Spider-Man villains is like they're, they're kind of in mass. Um, so it's been tough. I, I don't know how I would feel about Electro. Um, I don't think it's – I think it's one of those things like – if you can pick up some of those like cheaper keys and you can get them for a buck, great. Uh, and I think it's a lottery ticket if the Jamie Foxx Electro is popular. I, we always say, right, in 5G we trust. We trust the MCU version more than certainly the Sam Raimi stuff. And I definitely think we're heading towards some sort of Spider-Verse or at the very least Secret Six. And either way, both of those storylines will be popular. So there's a lot to be excited for. Um, so if you're sitting here like, F you guys, I love Electro. Then, hey, man, buying opportunity. That's what's great about the down portion of this list. And there's some buying opportunity with Electro right now. Do you mean Sinister Six? Yeah, what'd I say? Secret Six. <laughs> it's all good. We make mistakes. I made one. I said Secret Avengers. But. Secret Savage. <laughs> yeah. Bang, bang. <laughs> you know, That's how we roll. Sinister. Everything's a secret, all right? <laughs> I will say this. I like Jamie Foxx as an actor. Great actor. A lot of people will, will agree with that. I think part of that was I didn't really like that character as much, but I think it had the same thing with that Spider-Man number three, the Sam Raimi series, is when you try to put like so many villains into a movie, it kind of oversaturates it and you lose that that draw to him because it's like, well, there's so many in here anyways. Mm -hmm. Wasn't Jamie's best character, but like you said, I think if anyone could fix it, that whole Feige MCU could definitely work this out. Yeah. Unless yeah. Sony just takes over completely. To me, it had like a kind of like a Batman Forever sort of vibe to it where it was like, <laughs> yeah, he's, he didn't fit that character. Uh, he's a great actor. I think there's a job for him in the MCU. I have zero problem with them changing the races of a character that doesn't even, that doesn't phase me. Um, but I just don't think he hit that character yeah. well. I think he'll kill Spawn, though. If we can it Fawn, if we can ever get that movie. Yeah. But the last one we're talking about, the three down, we talk about FOC all the time on this channel. We even have a separate video series. The Last Call comes on every Friday night, 9 p.m. Make sure you guys check that out. But one of the things that are down is not all the publishers are on Final Order Cutoff. Yeah, and I want to make a direct plea to Diamond. Uh, to previews um I, I i beg you guys to get all of the publishers on foc and i know that's a big ask i understand that, that would cause more work but the publishers who are not currently on foc are honestly the publishers who need to be on foc the most i think the program is ass backwards it, it's i get it's essential so i don't want to come off like i'm i'm hating on the foc program but the logic behind it being either being like a barrier to entry, even boom studios had to fight their way on to get on to FOC uh, for multiple years. And you, you, that's something now, if we were to say to our audience, they would think that that's crazy, right? Like how you, what do you mean? What are you telling me? Like, but they weren't there. They weren't included. Um, there are a lot of great publishers from source point press to mad cave studios who you've heard us talk about regularly on the channel who are not currently included in the foc program black this box comics yeah black box comics this negatively affects their ability to market kind of cutoff dates that still exist for their books and projects it's like a foc date still exists for them they're just secret yeah and because it's not a public thing uh, uh, not a public program retailers don't know when the cutoff for these books are it puts so much more on the publisher and retailers are so they're creatures of habits so they're used to sitting down with these foc lists right before foc date and putting in their orders books not on that list are the ones that are constantly getting overlooked and the ones that then when you're having secondary market success like to use mad cave as an example they're experiencing right now with stargazer or or certainly um uh source point press's experience with no heroin and dead end kids 
these are the books that we as uh you know kind of tastemakers and 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 influencers i hate that word um of of independent comics creator owned comics uh, advocates of creator owned comics um the thing we get hit up with all the time when one of these books drops and and isn't available as well if somebody hit us up like stargazer i had a lot of people hit me up like i can't get stargazer best thing i could do was point them to simplemanscomics.com where we had stargazer number one exclusive variant available for 14.99 still copies available um limited to just 200 copies but you know you're not going to be able to produce an exclusive variant for every book and that's just a lot to put on the retailer so i don't blame the retailers for not ordering these books as much i think it's difficult we've talked about the physical previews catalog that a lot of these small press publishers tend to be in the back in the, their sections are smaller, which draw less attention. And if you understand it all marketing and how the eye works and the way that that affects, you know, what you remember and what you, the information you retain, what you see as important or what even draws your eye in the first place, um, they're already at a disadvantage. So I plead with previews to, to, to get these small press publishers on FOC. I think you'll see increased orders, which only helps the publishers, which only helps Diamond. Uh, which only helps creators, which only helps the lifeblood of our hobby. I can't come up with a negative for putting these small press publishers on FOC other than the amount of work it would take for previews. And it, if they're in need of somebody to help them out, well, you know, I know a guy. But either way, I definitely think uh, uh, that this is something that needs to happen now. Uh, we've been covering FOC now, Brian, for like a year now. Um, and this is just a consistent problem that we're running into. So uh, we're at the forefront of this topic. So we're going to bring it to you. Let us know what you guys think about this. Uh, let us know if, if you guys have experienced any difficulties with small press publisher publishers and call out the publishers in the chat, not to call them out personally, but call out in the chat, which ones that you're not able to find when you're looking for their books, um, because they, this can help us to, to figure out who's being left out. Yeah, I mean, pre-orders are important to comics as a whole, but they're even more important to these smaller the publishers that rely on those sales figures. But either way, there's our three up, three down. Let us know in the comments what do you guys think's up, what do you guys think's down. Like Jack said at the beginning, there's a lot of stuff that got left off this list this week that could have been on here. We want to know what you guys think. And with that being said, this is Jack and Brown of Superman's Comics. If I keep See you guys in the next show, video. Because one day we hit, uh-huh, one day we ain't.